Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Thank you so much uh, for coming along. Uh, my name's Peter, and I'm from the uh, Extra Donut Group, uh, and we are the people who've hosted uh, what you are attending now uh, and what has been two days of a, uh, the first ever uh, Extra Donut Economics Gathering. So some of you in this room have been here for the whole two days. Some of you have just stepped into it in this moment. You are all very, very welcome uh, to be here. Um, I'm just going to say uh, uh, very, very briefly a little bit about what we've been doing today, coming together, uh, and yesterday, exploring what Don Economics means in practice, what it means in Exeter, what it means uh, all around the UK and the world. We've had people who are doing amazing things with this idea from all over the UK coming together uh, in Exeter for the last couple of days. It's been uh, amazing. Uh, for everybody who signed up uh, for this event, we'll, we'll send you more information about that uh, in a follow-up email. Uh, and we'd love for anyone who is just getting into this idea to, uh, to get more involved uh, and find out more. Uh, and we'll send lots of uh, signposts to, to more resources and more reading and all sorts of things. Um, that's it for me. I'm now going to hand over to uh, James, James Dyke from the, the University of Exeter. Um, oh, actually, just before I do that, I'll say thank you very much to the Global Systems Institute uh, at the University of Exeter who have made uh, this event and the whole uh, gathering the last few days possible uh, generously supporting that. So thank you. Huge thanks to the GSI. Um, but I'll now hand over to James, who's going to take us through the next uh, two hours, uh, and I'll come back and, and say a few things to wrap up at the very end. James, over to you. Thanks, Peter. Oh. I don't, I've got a lapel. Oh, you've got a lapel, Mike. Peter doesn't get enough applause. Uh, so the last two days has been largely, not exclusively organised uh, by Peter, but he has been uh, the powerhouse behind uh, this event that's lasted two days and also the event uh, this evening. So I'm very, very appreciative of everything that Peter does and also the wider donor economics group. So my role this evening is to be a bit of a compare for the next two hours. So what we're going to have is a talk by Kate Raworth. So uh, this is the point if anyone's in the wrong place, you might want to discreetly leave, but I don't think you are. And what Kate is going to do, she's going to give us an overview, maybe a bit of a history of donor economics, and that's going to be for one hour. After that, we're going to have a bit of a, a five-minute turnaround, because then we're going to have a panel discussion. So we have a a panel of our esteemed guests, and the plan is for that to last about one hour. There'll be initial kind of introductory remarks, maybe some questions from me, but then the majority of the time we want from that panel discussion is an opportunity for you to ask questions to Kate and the panellists. So that means we should be finishing around 7.30 p.m., after which we do have a bit more time to network and socialise in the street, the venue immediately outside uh, this building. So, uh, I reckon you know quite a lot about Kate Raworth because you've turned up to her talk. Mm -hmm. And if you want to know more about her, then you could look online, you could Google Kate, you could look at her Wikipedia article, you could look at her bio and her various kind of affiliations. Today, she now leads the Donor Economic Action Lab, which was founded in 2019. That followed on from the tremendous success, I think the actual, the transformative impact that her book, uh, Donor Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist, that was published in 2017, which built on the equally transformative work of what came to be called the Oxfam Donor, which she released onto the world in 2012. And I think it was around 2012 that I first met Kate, or we connected. Because the minute that I saw the Oxfam donor, I immediately saw the potential that that has got to really extend and develop some of the efforts that we're making on sustainability. It's, it's very rare that you see an idea which can synthesize a lot of potentially complicated things and make it very discreet, make it very simple, make it intuitive and perhaps most of all show how it can affect real-world change. I'm an academic, so I'm an assistant director of the Global Systems Institute, so I'm the money tonight because we help fund this. Um, but my passion and interest has always been trying to connect academic activities to affecting real-world change, and we've seen that over the last two days. And Kate has been spearheading that work, not just in Exeter or the UK, but across the world, such that there are donor groups pretty much all over the place. And I'm sure we're going to learn a little bit more about that over the course of Kate's talk. There are very few people that I think are truly inspirational in the sustainability space, and certainly Kate is one of them. 
So I'm tremendously pleased and very honoured to be able to uh, ask you all to welcome Kate to the University of Exeter. Welcome, Kate. <laughs> That was a very nice welcome. Thank you, James. And I just want to reiterate, uh, well, but basically, some of us have been together for the last two days at the Exeter Donut Economics Gathering. Put your hand up if you've been part of that for the last two days. Hey, lots of us in the room. And this is our final gathering together. And put your hand up if you've just joined us right now for this session. Welcome. So it's fantastic. We've got people who've been talking about these ideas for two days and people who've just stepped into the room. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be here with everybody. Uh, thank you to... James, thank you to everybody, Peter and everybody who's come to that and made this happen. It's been a joy for me and my colleague Leonora and Rob, who are also here, to be in a space that somebody else is hosting about donor economics. It's quite surreal, you can imagine. It's amazing hearing other people giving talks about what you can do with this idea. It's been brilliant, really brilliant. So thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm going to talk about... Don't economics, I've got a little bit more time today, so I thought, oh, I can tell a bit about where it came from and some of the ideas of where I think it might go to and explore some of how it's getting put into practice. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation afterwards because, you know, nothing is moving fast enough in the world, nothing, including this. So how could we make this more adherent, dynamic, spreading? So I invite you to bring us questions to help us move it further and faster. I'm here because I'm here because I studied economics. It's called Don't Economics because I studied economics, and this is all my big reaction against everything I was ever taught. So I'm 53. I studied economics in the early 1990s. I went to Oxford University. I studied politics, philosophy, economics, and I lapped it up. I hadn't done it at A level, so I was like on that treadmill, quick catch up with everybody who'd already got an A at A level. That thing, learn it, learn it, learn it, and it took me a while to realise that there was something problematic with it. I didn't see it at first. Put up your hand now if you ever studied economics, if any way. OK, there's a lot of us in the room. OK, so, and that's just the power of... You can, let me just try something else. If you've ever studied physics beyond, like A-level or beyond, have you studied physics? Oh, there's lots too. OK. So economics is this world mindset that pervades, I think, that really is the mother tongue of public policy. And it goes into law, it goes into politics, it goes into business, it goes into every field, it goes into activism, right, journalism. So the economics that we learn shape the world that we're part of. And even if you never studied economics, don't worry, you haven't missed out, it's got you. Because you read it in the papers, you hear it on the news, you hear it in politician speeches. So I'm going to sum up what I think is the sum of 20th, 20th century economics in one slide. I'm going to give you that degree in one. You don't need to take out a student loan for this. So... <laughs> Three big diagrams, and I'm going to tell this story in diagrams. I think pictures are very, very powerful. We don't interrogate them in the way that we've been taught to interrogate words. Ooh, that's a contested concept. No, we see diagrams, and often they're dismissed as illustrations, but they're not. They go in our eyes, and they sit in our visual cortex, and they influence us our whole lives, and we don't even realize they're there, shaping what we put at the center and what we make peripheral, but they are. So visual framing is super powerful. Let's pay attention to it. OK, so the starting point of economics. OK, everybody who put up your hand, or even if you didn't, what's the first diagram you remember learning in economics? <laughs> Say it like we're in church, supply and demand, right? Why is it that you get the same answer to that question in every single lecture theatre across the world? I can't think of any other discipline that you could go, oh, what's the first diagram we learned in physics or biology or supply and demand? It's like, yeah. it's just... Right, It's just that's the starting point. And it's a really political and specific starting point. Economics. Welcome to economics, the art of household management. Here's the market. That's a really specific thing to do. First of all, it puts the market mechanism at the center of our vision, as if this is obviously home turf. It puts price as the metric of concern. So suddenly we're talking about price, and then, oh, well, if we want to talk about other things, it needs a price. And it means that anything that falls outside the market contract is called an externality. So it's a very specific way to begin. And then if we say, well, show me, show me the, the big picture. I, like, I want to see the biggest picture of the economy. It's a diagram called the circular flow diagram. So you've got households and business in this essential market relationship. That's what's going around at the top. Households provide, wage, the households provide labor or they provide capital. 
Some provide the labor, some provide the capital. In return, they get wages and profits. Some get the wages, some others definitely get the profit. They can use that money to buy goods and services so that consumer spending. So there's the kind of resources going round and round and money going round and round. And yes, there's some loops off. Apparently, banks take your savings and turn it into investment. That's not how banking works, but that's how we got taught. Government will take your money as taxes and then they can spend it, but that's not how it works either because governments in a country with a sovereign currency, governments can create money. And some will go on imports, but it comes back in through exports. But essentially, this is a closed system. We're seeing resources go round and round and money goes round and round. This is the biggest diagram of the economy I was ever taught in four years of studying economics. And it's still the dominant frame today. And it's got problems. The self-portrait, who are we? Who is the person at the heart of economics? The character at the heart of models was rational economic man. He didn't get a portrait, but I think pictures are powerful, so I thought he deserved one. And he'd have to look a bit like this. He would be a man. He's got no dependents. He's standing alone. He's got money in his hand. That's how he interacts through the market. He's got ego in his heart, self-interest. He's got a calculator in his head. He's got nature at his feet. He hates work. He loves luxury. He knows the price of everything, and he can never get enough. And these are the actual traits written down as premises, turned into equations that are the character of humanity in the heart of economics. Because way back in the 1840s and 50s, John Stuart Mill decided that political economy only treated man as a being who desired to possess wealth. And there he began an extraordinary caricature, a narrowing caricature. The real problem with this caricature is not how absurdly narrow it is. It's crazy. The real problem is that on being told that he is like us, we become like him. Students from year one to year two to year three, the more they learn of economics, the more they value competitiveness over collaboration, the more they value self-interest over altruism as effective traits as an economist. So who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become. We start to mimic our models. And that's an important insight for any discipline that claims to tell us who we are. It will literally remake us. So we need a far richer portrait of ourselves if we are going to thrive eight or 10 billion people on this planet together. And then the goal. The goal is written so deep. It's never drawn. It's never actually drawn in the textbooks. But it underpins every politician's speech and every economist's advice. And it is, of course, endless economic growth. And we've heard, in, uh, if you haven't heard the news yet today, there's going to be an election on the 4th of July. So we're going to hear a lot more about this goal in the coming months because we've had both Conservative Party, Labour Party for the last couple of years in the run-up. They've literally both said growth, growth, growth. This is the vision. This is the best vision that they're able to promise to the people of Britain. Growth. Growth is good. Growth, growth is the solution to our problems. And we're one of the richest countries in the history of humankind. It's, there's an absurdity that yet still here at this moment in time, in this context, this is the way we intend to solve our problems. So these diagrams underpin 20th century economics, and it took me a while to figure out what was problematic about them. One way we can explore that is say, hmm, where's the living world then? Like, how are you going to make visible any damage we might happen accidentally to do to the living world? And this is where I think it really shows up. So we come to supply and demand. Oh, yeah, well, those are environmental externalities. There's a gap between the private cost and the social cost. And that little red wedge I've shown you there, yeah, that's, that's climate breakdown. That's ecological breakdown. That's the death of coral. Any environmental problem, there it is. It's there, you see, and we've costed it. What about when it comes to the biggest picture? Where is the living world? Did you notice that it was just things going round and round? There was no earth. There was no inputs of materials and energy. There was no outputs of heat and waste. Where does the living world come in here? Ah, we can call it another kind of capital, natural capital. So it's not a bigger than the system, it's inside the system. It becomes part of the system. And I sincerely think that if aliens wanted to take down humanity, they do not even need to land here. They could literally convince us, dear humans, this is a rather wise way to talk about the planet on which you depend, don't you think? Good luck. Do you really think we're going to do justice to the living world if this is how she is depicted in our economics, which govern our policymaking? I think this is 
devastating. There's no way we will protect and respect the living world if this is how we talk about it and depict it in our most influential discipline. We have to rewrite and remake it. So let's turn to Bucky Fuller. Good old 1960s inspiration. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. Actually, we do have to fight the existing reality, but we need to do more. You need to change something by building a new model that makes the existing one obsolete. So sometimes the best form of protest is to propose something new. So what are we going to propose? Where will a new model come from? And I want to tell you a little backstory of where the donut, as one of many possible models, comes from. And that backstory goes back to the 1960s. Kenneth Boulding, an economist, in, the 19, in 1966, he wrote a fantastic essay called The Economics of Coming Spaceship Earth. And he said, you know, we've been living, I'm going to call this kind of open economy that we have. That, that one I showed is open, it just, there was no planet around it, it was just endless possibility. He said, the open economy, it's like a cowboy economy. We are behaving as if there are these limitless planes. There's always more beyond the frontier, and we can lasso the Earth's resources. There's always more we can capture and claim. It's a profoundly colonial concept, exploitative concept. Humanity just continually consuming and devouring. There will be more. Let's keep on going. And Boulding said, we have to shift from this cowboy economy towards a spaceman economy. We have to recognize that we are enclosed in a capsule of life that is called planet Earth. And we are dependent upon it and dependent upon this balance within it. And so we need to move from this unlimited planes of capture to cycling and working with an ecological reality of which we're a part. I think we, we haven't made this yet. We're still, you know, he was so prescient in 1966 to see this amazing metaphor of humanity's sense of ourself in relation to the rest of the living world. How do we make this actually become real? It was in the 70s that Herman Daly, one of the founding fathers of ecological economics, came up with a diagram that was massively influential in the founding of ecological economics. He said, look, the economic theory we've inherited operates in what you might call empty world. Yeah, there's the economy, there's that bit, and there's material and matter being drawn in. Let's recognize that it's an open system. It's drawing in matter, it's drawing in energy, it's putting out waste and pollution, and it's enclosed in a biosphere which has energy from the sun coming in and waste heat going out, but the economy is a subset of the biosphere. Now, when we were fairly small back in Adam Smith's day, right, billion people in the world, it was kind of feasible to imagine that, oh, the sky is so high and the seas are so deep and the land is so wide. What could we little humans possibly do to disturb this balance? But Daly said, we're not in empty, we're not in empty world anymore. We're in full world. Our economy is banging up against the edge of the biosphere. This completely changes the rationale of economics. You stop trying to minimize labor use and maximize resource use. You, you suddenly say that there's something different, scarce. We must minimize and be super efficient on our use of resources and, and employ more people to do so. It changes the dynamics of what you need to be caring about. When I came across this diagram, it had a huge impact on me, but because it was merely conceptual, I didn't know what to do with it, and I realized it went into the, my visual cortex as for many, many people, and it sat there waiting and waiting for a new use. For me, that moment came in 2009. I just had children. I had twins. I took a year off work. I immersed myself in that unpaid care economy of raising kids. I came back to work, uh, and somebody showed me some diagrams of the kind of interesting research that had come out in the last year, I put this in front of me, and I had this kind of boom moment, this visceral moment I and I knew nothing about earth system science. But what I was seeing was Johan Rockström and about 28 other earth system scientists had quantified Herman Daly's diagram. Like they'd said, Daly, we're not just banging up against the edges of the biosphere. That green bit is the biosphere. We are way overshooting. We are drawing these safe boundaries that we think are precautionary boundaries beyond which humanity shouldn't go. And now we're saying, where do we think we are in relation to them? And we're actually over at least three of them in those days. This, for me, was a real uh, a massive moment in thinking, my God, I thought this is the beginning of 21st century economics because now we have, it's bounded. We have the outside drawn. 
And I sat at my desk in Oxfam. I was in this big open plan office. People, there was a, people fundraising for a famine in the Sahel. People campaigning for health and education rights of children in India. And I, thought, I looked at that diagram and they said, you know, if, if you go back to the center of this diagram here, this is the place where humanity is not putting any pressure on the planet. And this green ring, this whole green ring is the safe operating space for humanity. I thought, hang on. If you go back to the very center, what, so we don't withdraw any water, we don't use any fertilizers, we don't burn any fossil fuels, we're not converting really any land, that's not a safe space. That's death and destruction for billions of people. So if there's outer limits, there must be inner limits too. I call them human rights. And so I decided to draw a donut. In fact, I rather like this. You see the donuts already there? You see that? <laughs> They'd already drawn it. They just didn't see that they'd drawn it. So I started scratching away at my desk. This is the first time I drew. I go, oh, the inside, the outside. Wait a minute, how should this be? It's quite funny. I wrote here, can you see this? It says, is this a useful concept? How seriously to develop it? I would never have guessed that 12 years later I'd still be here and engaging with it and talking about it. You know, it's that thing you don't know. And I actually shoved it in the bottom drawer of my desk. I was like, oh, well, I like that, but I'm a social scientist. I don't think natural scientists would take that very... I thought they'd go, very nice, dear. Love your passion, Oxfam. Thank you. Back to the science. So I put it away in the bottom drawer of my desk. And I actually, I turned it into a, I turned it into a PowerPoint. This was my PowerPoint skills in uh, 2011. Quite, quite similar today. Eh? But that, that sort of floor and ceiling, I was trying to say, hang on, there's, there's an inside and outside. Bottom of the drawer. I was invited to this university. This is etched in my mind. 18th of October, 2011. There was a workshop here on... What if we came up with a United Nations Declaration on Planetary Boundaries? What would that look like? Um, and my boss sent me. He said, you like, that, you like that planetary boundaries diagram. Off you go. And I was on the train. I was like, I don't, I, what am I doing? What am I going to say? I'm not a scientist. And I was having all these kind of social science insecurities. And I sat in the meeting. And within 20 minutes, uh, Professor Tim O'Riordan from UAE, he looks across the room at me. Uh, we'd never spoken. He said, I'm looking at our colleague from Oxfam because the problem with planetary boundaries has got no people in it. And everybody looked at me because I was Oxfam, so I was supposed to. And I had one of those moments you think, am I going to do it? Am I going to do it? And I remember it was a really fancy room. One of the walls was a whiteboard. I'd never seen a wall that was a whiteboard before. And there was a pen. And I thought, I'm going to do it. And I jumped up and I drew really quickly because I was worried they'd say, thanks for your passion, dear. Sit down. I drew this big circle and said, just as the planetary boundaries are outer limits, so there's inner limits too. And Timothy Lenton, sitting here in the third row, Tim Lenton said, that's the diagram we've been missing all along. It's not a circle, it's a donut. So if you have a problem with the name, blame him. <laughs> so, and, and I'm being totally honest here, and it was that moment where a natural scientist, like a proper scientist, he said, he said, that's good. I was like, ooh, it must, that's the thing now. It's endorsed, endorsed by hard science. It's a donut. And so I said, well, I'm going to write this up, actually. And I got on the train. I thought, right, write up a two-sider about this. And it was this ex amazing experience that just kept all that was coming, and it just it flowed out, and it turned into this little Oxfam discussion paper, which we published in February 20, 2012. And it had more impact than I could have possibly imagined. Uh, many people clearly, it seems, are actually visual thinkers. So many people said, oh, God, this diagram. At last, I, can, I work for, I don't know, WWF or Greenpeace, but at last I can show that I also care about people. Or I work for Oxford, but at last I can show I care about the environment too. It brings them together. And it had this real traction that fascinated me. I thought, wow, there's a lot of visual thinkers amongst us. And it brings us together to talk about, and, and some people were kind of empowered to talk about a new economy through it. It's like it was... It was empowering them to have a different political vision as well. So that got me fascinated in the power of pictures. And I have to say that uh, this came out in 2012, and I'm not sure it was somewhere in 2012, but the first academic to write to me and say, would you come and talk about that was James. So kudos to James. And, that's, and I'm extremely loyal because uh, I, I really appreciate it. That was a real moment for me that this is just an Oxfam discussion paper and a academic is saying, please come and talk about this to my students. And that was the first of many, many conversations. So, James, thank you. So, that came out. This donut says, right, the goal is not endless growth, it's thriving. It's a very different shape. That and that, very different. That's more like a heartbeat. Leave no one in the hole, but don't overshoot Earth's limits. Very different goal. 
meet the needs of all people. They come from the Sustainable Development Goals because that was a very contemporary, internationally agreed statement. All the world's governments have already agreed that no person has, should be left in this hole. And the nine planetary boundaries, the best, the best knowledge that we have to date, it's not finished, it's not perfect, but we are painting it as we go. This is really young science, and we needed it decades ago when we've got to work with that tension. So that's the goal, to thrive within that space. But we're very, very far from that right now. So when we took the planetary boundaries quantification and then added in the social shortfall, so all the red in the middle is the percentage of people who are falling short on life's essentials. Here, food, this little wedge goes 11% of the way to the center of the circle because 11% of people worldwide don't have enough food to eat every day. You want to eliminate that red. Some are measured with two variables, some with one. We want to eliminate all of this red. So I call this humanity selfie. This is our selfie of us and the state of the living world. This is a picture of now. And just reflecting on that, last century's economic theories, they ain't going to solve that. They weren't designed for this. They never saw this. My economics education was not designed in light of this. Why on earth would I think the theories I was taught, the policies that come out of it, would solve it? Last century's government policies and a lot of this century's government policies, are not going to solve this. Last century's business models, the champions of business, the CEOs who made great fortunes and corporations, they weren't designed to turn this around. In fact, they've caused a lot of this. Last century's lifestyles and aspirations and what we thought was a good life, not understood in light of this. We need to reinvent. So you could think that's overwhelming, or you could think it's an incredibly exciting time to be alive, to be an economist, to be a material scientist, to be a civil engineer, to be a professor, to be an academic teaching and bringing a new mindset. What kind of mindset in all the disciplines and all the areas of work would turn this story around? We can overlay it with the daily headlines. I was with some Brazilians on uh, Monday, and they said, please, please talk about the floods in Brazil. You know, we are really, really traumatized by the floods. And I didn't say this to them, but I partly wanted to say, do you know that most people in the UK have never heard about the floods that just happened in Brazil? Or maybe, oh yeah, I saw that, and turn the page or scroll. And most of these events and things that happen in particular places, we, we scroll past, we move on. But when it happens to that community, it is devastating, it destroys, it is life-changing. And how do we make sure that we don't become inured and immune to another hurricane, another flood, there's another drought? But uh, How do we stay alert to this? We've been talking over the last two days about Emotional responses. You know, am I right now, is this a terrible thing for me to be showing? Am I just filling you with doom and making you want to give up? Is this really bad communication? And actually, we shouldn't be filled with doom. Let me, let me make you, as James has been saying, I'm angry, right? Let's, let's tweak this a little bit. There's $200 billion worth at the moment of finance, which has been called nature positive. I've definitely put that in quotes. But it's finance that's coming into investing in nature-based solutions or nature restoration. Okay, that's nice. But pit that, that little blue square represents the size of it. There is there $7 trillion of global financial flows, which are actually driving climate change, driving biodiversity loss, land degradation. There's money. The global financial system is adding to this. It's fueling this. It's driving this. And it's getting record profits. We've just seen, you know, peak in, in the Dow Jones and the S&P 500 indexes. So the global financial system is profiting very nicely out of its utter degradation of this. It's profoundly political. I'm showing you a picture at the global scale. I want to take it down a level. So let's go to some national donuts. My, our colleague Andrew Fanning, Dan O'Neill, Jason Hickel, J Julia Steinberger, and others created a website, goodlife.leads.act.uk, of 150 national donuts. And you can see huge variations between Malawi, massive human shortfall, not overshooting their share of planetary boundaries. China, double whammy challenge. The UK, you can see our inequality. US, still high inequality on very high incomes, but massive ecological overshoot. To be clear, that red ecological overshoot is measured on a consumption basis. So for the UK, just looking around this room, thinking of the clothes we're wearing, the carpets, the chairs, the lights, the electronics, this stuff was not made here. It was imported. And our overshoot counts the stuff that we're using because this is what enables a great life here. So we count it in the consumption basis. 
So there's four nations. Let's put them in a scatter plot along with around 50 others. The place where we all want to be or should aim to be is up here. Whoop. Can't find it. Up there in the top corner because that's where you, you go up. You rise up to meet the needs of all people, right? That's eliminating the social shortfall, but you do it coming back within the planetary boundary. So that's the sweet spot. And for me, the first thing this diagram tells us, invites us, next time you hear yourself or anybody talking about developed countries, you can say, I'm sorry, where do you mean? <laughs> because there's absolutely nothing developed. Hello, United States, Canada, Australia. Norway, you know, the Nordics. I love showing this to the Nordics. You should see the draw drop. But we're not at the top. Well, you are at the top, but that's not a good place to be. Like, that's the wrong place. You want to be here. Look who's closest, Costa Rica. Costa Rica is closer than any other country to almost meeting its people's needs nearly within the means of the planet. And that should give us a lot of hope. And Costa Rica is a country that's done some very intentional things. Big investment in health and education. Stopping deforestation since 1987, right? They've put policies in place that help to explain some of that story. So... Those are the three countries I show, the four countries I show before you can see that array across the, the, the lines. And of course, the scatter plot is deceptive because these countries aren't separate little entities, each doing their own thing. They're profoundly connected by histories of colonialism, by military power, corporate power, by trade and finance rules, resource extraction, the future and impacts of climate and ecological breakdown, predominantly from the global north to the global south, but much complexity in between. So all of our stories are interconnected. Now, the history of pursuing growth generally takes countries in that direction. And it makes a massive difference if you're Malawi and you double your income per capita. Massive difference in child survival, nutrition, kids going to school, women's empowerment, <coughs> dignified good lives. And again, but at some point, instead of heading up towards Costa Rica, the vast majority of countries turn that additional income into ecological overshoot, excessive consumption, and we go straight past that point. So just following growth as we've always done is just going to keep taking us there. Could we pursue different trajectories? Could the low-income nations, and I'm talking Malawi, Nigeria, Senegal, Pakistan, India, Nepal, could these countries rise and meet their people's needs without overshooting like most countries before have done? What would that take? What would have to happen to make that possible? Because that's a pretty unprecedented path. Could middle-income countries from Bhutan, China... Bhutan is there, people sometimes think, because they have gross national happiness. They think they'd be in the donut. They're not. They're there. Right? They're there. Bhutan, China, Turkey, Russia, Iran, Mexico. These countries are probably going straight past it, making massive infrastructural investments in housing, in transport, in electricity, laying down infrastructures that will determine their future direction. Could they reorient to meet people's needs while already coming back within planetary boundaries? That has not much precedent. And then high-income nations, like this one, like all high-income countries, massively reduce this very visible red overshoot while finally meeting the needs of all their people because they certainly have the resources to do so. Also an unprecedented journey. So everyone's on an unprecedented trajectory here. It's time for a lot of humility and a lot of ambition. And of course, if this were to happen, there is enormous rebalancing required between North and South. Rebalancing is that... Reparations is that redistribution of wealth, redistribution of power, rewriting the rules of trade in international institutions and many, many forms. Well, what would it take? For me, this has become like an uber map of directionality of where we want to be going and against which you can consider international events or domestic policies. Is it taking us towards this or not? And, and you can feel the complexity of it all at once as well. So what, if, what kind of economics would actually even give us a chance of starting to move in this direction? What kind of mindset and transformation? And I, when I first published The Donut, I started getting quite playful with images saying, you know, what if you, we each put our own life on this table and asked ourselves, how does the way that I shop and travel and eat and invest and divest and protest and volunteer and vote, how does the way that I live determine whether I'm pushing my life outside the donut or I'm actually helping humanity live within it. What if every company sat down around this table and said, OK, let's be honest, the way we've made money in the past has been by pushing people in and the planet out. How could we make our future company, could it, could it be transformed to be a vehicle for actually making this happen? What would that take? What if architects, when they're designing 
a new district, a new building, had the donut on the table. Some of them actually got in touch and said, I've got the donut on the table as I design this building, this, this area. What, how would that change the way where they were working? What if the G20 finance ministers met around the donut table and actually had a conversation about financial and earth security? How would that change their deliberations? What if world government <laughs> met around this table? And most surreal of all, what if economics lectures didn't start <laughs> with supply and demand, but actually started with, well, here's a goal. What kind of economics would actually give us half a chance of getting there? And that's the one I'm focused on, because that's where I came from, right? We tend to, we tend to sort of dig where you stand, address the challenges that you've understood from your experience. So as a really uh, disillusioned economics student, I've been brought back drawn back to sort of, okay, how would we change the mindset? And once the donut came out, I noticed lots of people had different visions of, oh, this is green growth. And I was like, I really don't think this is green growth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and write down what I think is the economic mindset that would give us half a chance of getting there. And that's why I wrote Donut Economics five years later. I left my job at Oxfam thinking, actually, the best act of advocacy I can do now is to write this book. It is an act of advocacy to... to it, to be the book that I wish I could have read when I was a student that said, if you don't get economics, don't worry. It's not that there's something wrong with you. Actually, there's something wrong with economics. Hold on to what feels intuitively right, because you might be right. So I wrote this book. So let me whiz through some of the seven ways. We've already done, right? Change the goal from growth to the donut. Okay, change the big picture. The big picture should be a really big picture that recognizes the economy is a subsystem of society, a subsystem of the living world, and utterly dependent upon it. Let's draw in the physics of thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics, and the solar energy coming in and the waste heat going out. I hope you can see Herman's Daly's diagram there, right? The economy subsist, subset of the, of the earth. Drawing in material and matter, putting out waste and pollution, it's a subsystem. It's an invention. It's a social construct. So it's embedded in societal uh, social constructs as well, and it's embedded in the living world. And therefore, we need an economy that's compatible with our social and ecological reality. We need to design it to, to be in service to that rather than the other way around. Everything else is service to the economy. And then inside the economy, let's recognize that there's, okay, there's the market, yes, but there's also the state, and the 20th century became this ideological boxing match between the two, free market, laissez-faire capitalist, or state-loving socialist, choose. And in that boxing match, we lost sight that actually there's also the household of unpaid caring work and the commons of collaboration. And then in the market space, we're told, you know, show up as rational economic man, consumer, producer, you laborer, or the capital owner, or destitute, excluded. But also in the state, who are we? We have many roles. Many roles, you might be a resident of a place, a public servant, a protester, a voter, or you might be stateless and unrecognized. In the household, a parent, a child, a relative, a partner, that care role that we all play, or you may be kinless and excluded from those relations. In the commons, a commoner, a steward, a co-creator, a volunteer, as Eleanor Ostrom told us, there are real specific rules that people learn to work by to make the commons work, or you may be excluded from the commons. And in the finance space, do you credit a debtor, invest a speculator, or exclude it? So each one of us could actually think, oh, I, I, you have many, many roles in this. And I think it's really important to name that all of these are roles that we play in relation to the economy. They all shape the economy. We're not customers and consumers. We are all of these, all of these characters. And they draw on different values and principles and ethics. So rational economic man, not even he is very good in the market space. The best companies are not super competitive inside. Research has shown actually they destroy themselves by pitting their teams against each other. Collaborative companies do much better. But in these other spaces, you know, how can we collaborate? How can we work together, build trust? It calls on very different human values of our pro-sociality, of our mutualisms between each other. So it calls a much bigger version of ourselves than the economists ever told us we were. We need a much richer version of humanity if we're actually to thrive in all of our economic spaces. So a big picture with a far richer version of humanity at the center of it. Changing the dynamics, right? We've inherited a linear industrial degenerative economy. We take Earth's materials, make them into stuff we want, use it for a while and then throw it away. And 20th century CEOs have actually made billions on the back of that. But this is destroying the life support systems of our planet. We need a regenerative economy, symbolized here by the kind of circular or regenerative economy. We don't waste stuff 
There's no away. Waste is a resource in the wrong place. We've got to recycle, reuse, refurbish, repurpose, and share. So how do we do that? A few examples just to land it in the world from the world of urban design, moving towards regenerative design. People often say the best buildings are the ones that will exist, right? Use materials as treasure and bring people to retrofit and renovate them and renew them for new purposes. This place in Amsterdam is a district in which only circular construction is permitted to, to push them forward in terms of learning this new circularity. So everything there has to be clipped and bolted. It can't be cemented and glued. Materials have a passport so you know where it's come from, you know where it's going. And they're pushing themselves to the forefront of a circular economy through that. Passive housing in New York, the way it's designed and built and insulated means you almost need no radiators inside. It, the heat controls and manages itself. And then here, recognize this, that buildings are part of an ecosystem, this sponge city in Kunli in China. The water's going to come. So don't try and build concrete barriers, but actually allow it to be absorbed and let this place belong in its ecosystem. So these are just some possible forms of design towards urban regenerative design. But of course, it's happening in every every, every sector and sphere, from clothing to food to buildings like this. And as well as from degenerative to regenerative, let's recognize we've inherited divisive economies that capture value and opportunity in the hands of a few. The rise of a 1%, the returns, whether it's the coding of capital, the infrastructure, inheritance and privilege, those who have are best at getting more. The system supports that. How do we turn that into a distributive economy that shares value far more equitably with all who co-create it? And that can turn out to be the whole of society. So again, in the area of um, construction and buildings, in Vienna, the majority of people in that very elegant European city, the majority of people live in social housing. It's normal, it's central, it's affordable, it's good quality. Because the city of Vienna decided over 100 years ago that housing is not a luxury investment asset for the wealthy. Housing is a human right. So they decided to own the city's housing so that it could be in service to the human rights of people to have affordable, decent housing in the city center. In Chile, the ar architect Alejandro Aravena realized that many people could never afford to buy a house, but they could buy, buy half a house. So he literally designed these half houses with all the electricity, the plumbing, the heating. People could buy that. And then when they'd saved enough money up, they fill the second half in. So you get, so it opened up house ownership to a whole sway the people who otherwise would have always been renting their whole lives. Community self-build, this is black community-led build, a place called Nubia Way in Lewisham, 13 houses that were built by the community. They said, we have nothing to offer but our labor, but that is everything. And it took years to build those houses together, and it became their home that they then now inhabit until they move away, and they can pass it on one generation. So it's about providing your labor to be part of that construction, changing who gets to own and design a home. And in Cleveland, Ohio, asking who gets to get those skills as we retrofit and bring in the solar, who will be skilled up? Let's bring in communities who've been historically marginalized from these opportunities and put them at the heart of it. So the evergreen cooperatives in Cleveland, Ohio, are black-led at the heart of the community regeneration, bringing in these skills, cooperatives, so making sure that that value of Solar and renewable energy is a distributed opportunity in the society. Okay, and then where does that leave us in growth, right? So we want to be regenerative by design and distributive by design. And then we've got to face up to the fact that we've inherited economies that need to grow whether or not that makes us thrive. It's structured into the workings of our economy after 100 years of fossil fuels. It seems normal that things will grow. I think this is the existential question of the century. How can we now create economies that enable us to thrive, whether or not they grow? They are no longer growth dependent. But that what we're pursuing is regeneration. We're pursuing distribution. And of course, different countries are at very different places on this story. So I would imagine Malawi may still well be here. I hope and expect that Malawi will see a lot of economic growth, but that it should be regenerative and distributed so it's channeling into people's well-being. But high-income countries may well be up here, may well have overshot this place, and we need to come down. And to me, that is the, tricky, the trickiest question that we can come back to later if we want to. Okay. We need to let go of that cowboy. He's still got us driving up here. I mean, right, the UK is still, come on, grow, grow. There's more to take. How can we give ourselves that spaceman mentality and actually learn to thrive instead? So those are some of the ideas at the heart of the book. This book came out in 2017. 
There's another book on the shelf in the shop, very nice, books, ideas on the page. And something really exciting happened, that people just started playing with it. People just took the ideas, maybe because it was called donuts, because a lot of people are frightened of economics, right? It's intimidating. But no one's frightened of donuts. You might love them, you might hate them, you don't have to eat them, but you're not frightened of them. You know there's something playful going on here. Thank you, Tim Lenton. Yeah, you, you had a donut that day. Like, why did that come to you? Yeah, he had. Um, people started playing with it. Uh, te- I like this one at the top. Teacher says, oh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to teach the curriculum. I'm going to teach the donut because this is what the students should be learning. The government of China launching their 2017 uh, s- renewable energy strategy. Somebody, a former student of mine said, I'm in Beijing, and they just put this up on the screen. Like, there was the donut. The government of China saying, this is, this is the direction we're going. And I was amazed. Dutch people started making silly glasses. Don't trust the Dutch. They always do, really. They just go daft in a most wonderful way. Uh, School students started making videos on YouTube explaining it to each other. This was cool. Playing with it in the playground. Students holding a festival. Up there, somebody held a workshop in Berlin. What would it mean for Berlin to live in the donut? It's like, wow, people are playing with it. So when I met my colleague Carlotta, who became the co-founder of Donut Economics Action Lab with me, we asked ourselves this question, how can we help pioneers like these, people who are just doing it, how can we actually put these ideas into practice? And that's why we founded Donut Economics Action Lab. And the name is really intentional. It's all about action. There's plenty of ideas in the world. There's, There's a book, another book on the shelf with lots of ideas. How do we now actually do this? And how do we support the people who have clearly already started doing it? How are they doing it? What is working? What can we learn with them? And it's a lab, because this is one big experiment of trying to put new ideas into action. How will it go? So let's learn from some other people who've had impact in the world. And we decided to start with Milton Friedman. Yes, father of neoliberalism. Only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. Over the last two days, we've been talking about tipping points and tipping points you want to bring about and are the conditions right? And I think Friedman's saying the ideas have got to be around. They've got to be available to pick up. But we ask ourselves, why would you just have them lying around in a book? We don't want them lying around. We want them up and running. We want them actually in practice in places so you can see that it's already proof of concept in practice. And then Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman to be elected to the House of Representatives in the U.S., If they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. (laughs) Economics departments are still definitely not giving us a seat at this table. They do not, like, mm, don't want it. So we're going to bring the most irresistible, playful folding chair. We're going to show up playfully with donuts. We're going to bring hose pipe. We're going to, you know, we're going to charm the pants off the economic institution. Actually, we're going to come left field and they won't quite know what to do with us. But we're going to make ourselves around through irresistibility. So we're a team of 15 people, Donut Economics Action Lab. We we live in about four countries. We work online. We spend almost all of our time working together on Zoom. But we're a tiny part of a huge community of people who've joined our platform, set up other organizations. We are learning and working with these communities all the time, every day. So just a few examples of the things that are actually getting into practice. We're really excited about helping to reframe the narrative at the top level, right? Not, and I'm not talking about in economic meetings, but the public narrative that dominates. Can we change the framing of that? And so it's a thrill every time somebody out there picks it up and, and says it back to us. David Attenborough wrote a small chapter in his latest book about donut economics, and he said, this is the compass. You know, think of the number of people who love David Attenborough. I mean, that's an amazing influencer to have on your side, not to mention Pope Francis, who said, you know, he mentioned donut economics in his recent book, and so... That kind of, having those kinds of voices can be phenomenally influential to bring over people who otherwise would have never looked. We were really excited uh, this year. We were on both Pointless, question on Pointless. What's it? It's a crazy question. Ring-shaped bakery product that is used to visualize economist Kate Rayworth's model for living within planetary boundaries. 47% of the audience knew the answer. Um, but also on University Challenge. So it's like, oh, we're hitting mainstream. We're on the quiz shows now in the UK. And it was mentioned in EastEnders. I did an interview with, uh, on, on the rest is politics. So it's like we're getting into the mainstream, get, starting to change the debate here. And this needs to go so, so much further. We work across six 
themes. We, in our team, we said, okay, let's divide this work up into six themes. And of course, things don't fit perfectly in themes, but these are communities or areas of practice that just started coming to us from the very beginning, and we need somebody dedicated to work with them. So Rob is here. Rob works with communities. Leonora's here. She works with local government in cities and regions. And that's a lot what we've been talking about the last couple of days. I'm just going to talk about those two. I'm not going to be able to touch on everything else, but all of these matter. What I want to say is institutions don't lead, right? It's not that local governments lead or businesses lead or schools lead or researchers and universities or government. They don't lead. That's not leadership. Where is leadership? It's people. In all of these institutions and all these different kinds of organizations, there are people, individuals who have some conviction here that they're going to make something happen. And it's those people you want to connect with. So across all kinds of organizations, there are people. And everywhere, in companies you love and companies you hate, in governments you like or parties you hate, there are people actually who want to make change happen. They're keen to act. And if only we can find those amongst them who actually love connecting with others and connect them. And that's a lot of the work that we do at Donor Economics Action Lab. And I think that's a lot of what's been happening in this exit to donor gathering over the last couple of days. People from so many different realms connecting. And you get that amazing energy of others when you start to realize, oh, we're working in different fields, but yes, we have that same intention to make change happen. How can we build momentum off that connection? One of the tools that we use that we know is building most of that, a lot of that connection, is unrolling the donut. So here's what we do. When people bring it to a place like Exeter or Barcelona or Amsterdam, one of the first questions I showed you, Berlin, they were like, can we do that here? So we turned it into a tool. What would it mean for our place to live in the donut? And you can think of your town, your Exeter. You can think of where you were born, where you live. What would it mean for your place? So we unroll it to make some space between the social foundation and the ecological ceiling. And we have a little question, little question, big question, really. How can our place how, uh, become a home to thriving people and an ecologically thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? I know that's a big, long, complex question because it's a big, long, complex issue, really. And we divide it into the local aspirations, what it would look and feel like to be here, but also our global connections, recognizing that every place is connected to and responsible to and dependent upon the whole world. So we divide it into these four lenses, and I'll just quickly share it with you. The most familiar question to a place is, how could all of the people of our place thrive? What would it mean for everybody who lives here to have good food and health and education and housing, all that social foundation, no one left short? That's a local conversation. What do we think that looks like here? And who is falling short? And how can we make sure that their needs are met first? How can our place be as generous as nearby nature? This comes from the biomimicry thinker Janine Benyus. How can we go to the wild land next door? She's not in her full natural wildness. She's definitely been changed. But there's a healthy landscape next door. What's nature figured out to do here? How can nature sequester carbon? and store groundwater, and house biodiversity here, and cool the air on a hot day from the treetop to the forest floor. Take nature's performance standards, because she's showing us what can be done here. Can we bring that back to our towns and our cities and our agriculture and aim to be as generous as she is? So it's setting ecological performance standards for the place. So these are the two local aspirations. And when you live in a place like Norway, like Sweden, like Denmark, they do very nicely on these. And it's like, oh, we can swim in the harbor and the forest are clean and the air is good. And this is the most developed place, right? But no, because there's a whole other half of the story, which is our impacts on others in the way we seek to live well. So how can we respect the health of the whole planet? And these are the nine planetary boundaries. And this is where those high-income countries are in massive overshoot and need to come back within because of our draw of energy and materials from the whole world and impacts, but also people worldwide. I mean, who stitched the clothes that we're all wearing today? Were they paid a living wage? Who made the carpets and assembled the devices that are in all of our hands and pockets? Who's impacted now by the climate change that we know that our lifestyles are creating? How will people be welcomed, a culture of welcome, a policy of welcome, when they come and seek refuge? and many, many other ways in which we are connected to people worldwide. So these are the four lenses that we invite places to look into, however uncomfortable that feels, and to ask, what is it can we do here that helps us move into the donut? Because it's not just about us, it's about our impact elsewhere. So there's over 80 
local governments, cities or regions or districts or counties around the world that have chosen to use this as a tool for transforming their place. I think it's places where there's people who have that conviction and they see this tool and they see other places and they think, you know what, this will be like a, a sail to our ship. This will help us and propel us, bring about the transformation that we want to bring about. So a few examples. Glasgow is one of the more recent places that just got started. They, they're saying, what does it mean to be a thriving Glasgow? They ask exactly those questions, big public conversations around it. They've drawn up their own Glasgow donut. They've started plotting it. I mean, this isn't pretty, is it? This is Glasgow's ecological overshoot. That's not, that's not to be proud of. And kudos to any place that publishes that, because that's like, we are a massive overshoot. And whatever we go forward, even if we go growth, 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 well, we have to massively reduce our overshoot of planetary boundaries. So that's going to be a different kind of growth than we ever did before. And by the way, there's going to be social shortfall here too, and that's un uncomfortable to publish. So kudos to the places that are doing this. Barcelona is a place that have gone a f step further. They've done the whole donut. You can see it there. They, you can now recognize the four lenses. They've quantified it. And they're starting to, it's, to now the point is, okay, right? It's not enough to do the donut. We've done our donut. We've done it. Okay. Now, how are we going to transform it? How are we going to get rid of all that red overshoot? What are the policies you're going to put in place? Barcelona is famous for its super blocks, if you're not familiar with them yet. All those trees used to be traffic jams between the grids of the street, and they just lifted the cars out. They put in trees. They turned private car space into community space. You've got playgrounds. You've got community. You've got the commons, people meeting, building community. You've got cooling. You've got nature helping the city be absorbed, right? They're doing lots and lots of things that help bring you into the donut. And they're using this framework to bring about a cultural sustainability as part of a much bigger plan. So Barcelona is like real kick-ass in action on this. And the donut is one part of a much bigger plan they have. Cornwall, nearby, and I know people in this room have been involved in this. Cornwall have gone another level and saying, we're going to actually turn the donut into a decision-making tool. We've got the Cornwall wheel, the donut decision wheel, and we're going to run potential projects through it asking, is it doing positive things? Is it doing negative things? How could we improve that project? So instead of doing a classic cost-benefit analysis where everything gets a price, as if it was a market, we're actually going to look at it in social and ecological terms. And then having this Cornwall 2050, 20, to 2050 plan, I really like this because the colors tell us the directionality that things are going in. You know, you could say Cornwall's GDP went up by 1.3% last year. I, I made that up. Don't report it. It's like, I don't know what it is. But like, who? okay, 1.3%. So what? Was that a shipwreck that we cleared up? Was that, I don't know, with a lot of divorce? I mean, what was that 1.3%? This is telling us actually about the real lives of people, the real direction and the real health of the world. This is a much richer measure of a place. The government of Bhutan came across the donut and they said, oh, we've got this concept, gross national happiness, and we like the donut. We think there's a real connection, so we want to... Use gross national happiness in the donut. I'm like, are you sure you're going to start saying that? What? Gross national happiness in the donut. What have you done, Tim Lenton? <laughs> gross national happiness in the donut. They say, like, these ideas work well together. We want to redesign the future of Timpu, our capital city. It's starting to sprawl. It's starting to become a bit exploit, um, you know, consumptive like many other places. We want to actually bring it back in. We're going to use these concepts together. So from... And we, we run some wonderful seminars with... Um, civil servants of Bhutan talking about the connection between these ideas. And I want to lastly land here. Um, uh, Leonora did this brilliant report, learning from all the places. So we're not telling them, this is how to do it. We're saying, how are you doing it? Learning, what are all the ways that places are getting started? How do you start as a change maker with conviction in a local council? How do you even start getting this done? And she said, I think there's nine different ways, and let's look at examples from all these places. This report is clearly really inspiring to others who can say, I think that might, we, would, we wouldn't get started like that, but we could get started like that. So that's from the local government angle. Now bring in the communities, right? There's so many community organizations, including here in Exeter, saying we're going to make our local donut coalition. We're just going to get together and get started and work with the city council, but work as a community. Start bringing that energy. We're going to make our own donuts. You get these kind of glorious <laughs> community interpretations of the donut. What does it mean to us here? You get building on that portrait. Not everybody wants to gather data, and that's just one approach to it. You can do the targets and indicators, but you can also walk out into the place. How does it feel to be here? What does it actually feel and look like to live here? 
How can we recognize the strengths we already have and what's going well, as well as the challenges we have that we must focus on and that should be the heart of turning the story around? What's the story and history of how this place came to be like this, the infrastructures of which we are embedded? What can we dream? What can we possibly make happen here? So there are many layers, and Rob's been doing wonderful work with community groups on this and always saying, you know, the beautiful thing about this is everybody can contribute to this. Everybody has a skill to offer here, even if it's just to ask great questions. So everybody can feel involved in making this portrait. In, Le in uh, Birmingham, there's an incredible organization called Civic Square who have really been pioneering this work brilliantly. They did the Ladywood is a, a d district in uh, Birmingham. They did the Ladywood Donut, but as you can, you can just feel it from these images that they bring great play to it. Everybody's invited into this conversation. It's about local transformation, and they're doing it at the level of retrofitting one street. Can we bring these ideas into practice here? But what blows us away and thrills us is just the sheer play that comes again and again from people in community. You know, you can bake it like a pizza, you can knit it, you can turn it into a little book, you can make a donut, you can dance the donut, you can play and chalk it in the street. The playfulness that returns to the economic conversation when we look at it this way. So all these ideas and tools are on our platform if you're interested. DonutEconomics.org, you're welcome to become a member, you're welcome to browse, you can download all these tools, I haven't even touched on the business tools. We're creating tools for uh, curriculum materials for universities, if anyone wants to teach it, here are some slides, here are some some um, articles and readings. Let, let's make this as easy as possible. So I want to wrap up and just think about where does it go forward? Because donut economics is just a passing idea. Like every, every, all of these ideas are passing ideas, and then we'll move on, and something else will come along. And we'll say, well, that was useful for them, and now let's move on. So when we set up Donut Economics Action Lab, Carlotta and I said to each other, how long do we plan to last for? We're not trying to be around forever. We're not trying to make an institute. Let's be around so long as we believe that these ideas are effective. And how will we know that? And when will, when will we know that something else that should replace it has come along and we say, Donut, you were really helpful. Let go and leave. Like fossil fuels, you were really helpful. It's time to go, right? There will be a day that we say, Donut, you were great. But, and people were, you know, 2050. Were they really talking about donuts? What the hell was that about? We'll move on. I hope that what will stay is a regenerative future, even if it's not that word but that regenerating the living world, a distributive future that is far more sharing of value. And let's keep moving on. So one way I would like to see it move on, just playing with ideas, cowboy. Let's move past cowboy to spaceman. But actually, spaceman is a very 60s metaphor, and it's not even on this planet, right? Spaceman's up there. It's a guy. He's in a very tech machine. There's not a lot of life up there along with him. So can we land back down here and... Many people now talk about the web of life and see ourselves in the web of life. And I think that's a place where a really great challenge to the donut. Why is humanity at the center and where's the rest of life? So if I go to the, the here, I think it's a really good challenge to say, hmm, of these nine planetary boundaries, one of them's a bit different from the rest. What we're calling here biodiversity loss, basically all other living beings. All other living beings are stuck out there on the edge, and humanity's in the middle. That's a bit rich. What if we were to invite all living beings into the center with us, a council of all living beings, and say, how do we live well together? Right? What if the social foundation was for all living beings, not just humanity? What principles and ethics could we draw upon to thrive together? I'm really waiting for a master's or a PhD student to say, this is my question. And to, to take this on, like, what would we draw upon? A human animal rights would we draw upon? Would we draw half Earth? Robin Wall Kimmerer's concept of the honorable harvest? What principles are out there? What, what ethic is written into the world's religions, into ways people do live, that we could actually address this? And, and Skep is here, right? This is the, the B Skep that's been accompanying us over the last two days, representing all other living beings. There aren't any actually bees in here at the moment. But we can imagine other living beings here with us. What would they say to us? Oh, at last, you actually gave us space. Now let's get talking. So for me, this is one way that I think it'll evolve. It'll keep moving. That doesn't mean the donut as it is isn't useful. For some people, this is way too out there. The donut is a perfect arrival point for them. But then others will move on beyond it and move on beyond it and move on beyond it. And I find that really um, 
releasing, actually. Like, let's use it and move on. So please, if anyone in the room has got an idea that's ready to, like, post-date the donut, bring it on. Let's keep rolling this forward. So I'm just going to end where I began. This is so out of date, and I, what makes me angry is that I know that the vast majority of students who go to university and study economics are still being taught this. They are still being taught this, probably in economics departments here, certainly in Oxford, where I, where I teach in the Environmental Change Institute, in universities around the world. This is still too much what they're being taught, and in no way equips a generation for the realities of today and the challenges ahead. And the students know it, and that's why they've created Rethinking Economics International. They want to do, uh, they're calling to be taught donut economics in the university. They want to put pressure on their professors. Whether it's called donut economics or ecological feminist complexity, institutional economics, bring it on. It is time. We need a far richer starting point. Here's one that has some traction right now, but let's keep it moving. Let's keep developing past this. Because we need the mindsets, and we need to keep them live and alert. We need the mindsets that will equip us for the realities we now face. I'm going to stop there, and I massively invite questions, challenges, and ideas to how to move what we're doing now faster, and also how to keep moving on beyond this. Thank you very much. <laughs>